I don't know who the writer is of this email. In other words, he doesn't give me his name, but that doesn't matter because this is really, really a cool story. He writes, I grew up hunting, fishing, and running trap lines, so it was only natural that I get a job working for the California Fish and Game while I was in college. Later, I spent two decades working for the U.S. Forest Service. One morning in September 1993, while I was working for the Forestry Service, I arrived at a small clear cut located in the middle fork of Feather River at 11.30 a.m. It was a wild and scenic spot above the town of Oroville, California, and very remote. It had taken me two hours to get there. It was the last of three small clear cuts done on that ridge, just before it dropped down to the scenic river. We call those cuts mountain lion cuts after a lion that had been seen there several times. The last cut was nine acres that headed east up the slope, and at the bottom was a 20-foot circle of brush that had no trees worth harvesting, so it had been spared. I crawled into the brush with my lunch and decided to be quiet and hidden as I ate so that maybe I could see the lion come through. After 25 minutes, nothing had come by, and I was finished with lunch. As I was packing up, I heard a large limb or a small tree snap a couple hundred yards across the clear cut. I thought it must be a range cow, so I didn't even bother looking up. The clear cut had been replanted in the spring. My job that day was to take 24-foot plots and count how many trees survived in every third plot. I walked out a few yards into the clearing and poked my tape measure into the ground, pulled out 12 feet and started making a circle, counting each tree within the circumference as I did so. When I was done, I walked 120 paces, maybe 110 yards, to the lower section and completed the second plot. And then I looked across and decided I could fit one more plot along the bottom, so I took off counting 120 paces. I was 30 yards from the brush on the opposite side when I heard another large limb being snapped off a tree. This time it was done close enough that it startled me, and I snapped my head up and looked through the manzanita. Through a three-foot hole in the brush, I saw a leg, or a back of a leg anyway, from the knee down. It was 40 yards away, and the sun was shining on it. The sunlight lit up the two-inch-long red hair that covered the leg. It was close to the color of an orangutan's hair. The calf muscle was large and lean, and I stared at it and thought to myself how well this thing was built. It took a couple of steps up the hill, and I saw the muscle flexing up and down in its leg. I stopped, and until that moment I hadn't thought much about whether or not they were real, but just then I was thinking they do exist. I started walking up the hill in a calm, no-rush manner that gave me time to observe it. And at 80 yards away, I could see all the way up the left leg. I could see the bud about halfway down the right leg. The hair was all the same light-colored red, and its butt was pronounced and muscular. Seeing it from the waist down, I thought it was built very much like a professional football player, larger and taller, but not by much. At a hundred yards away, I got my first glimpse of the entire backside of the creature from the neck down. From the waist up, it was massive. The shoulders were seven feet off the ground and five feet across. Ahead of it was a dense, dark patch of tan oaks, and it stepped into the trees, and it was gone. I stood there, fascinated by what had just happened. I did not take a step during this entire encounter. I just stood there in amazement. Above this dark patch of tan oak stood a single tree that was six inches in circumference. It was cut off and bent 180 degrees at six feet off the ground. The creature stepped out of the oak patch and put its left arm on that tree, and as it leaned in, the tree dropped seven more inches. It turned its head and it looked at me. Now I could see the left part of the body and a little bit of its head. The only feature I could see was that it was not covered in long red hair like the rest of the body. It was too far away now to make much else out. 
and I noticed there was no hair at the elbow of the left arm either. It looked as if it had been scraped or worn off, and the skin was dark black. I don't know how long this lasted. It was long enough that I wondered how the creature with such red hair could have such dark skin. We stood there staring at each other for a bit, and then it straightened up and turned and took two steps before it was gone. I did not see it or hear it again. In fact, I never heard it except for the two times it broke large limbs or small trees. I never felt fear or anxiety. It was never aggressive toward me nor seemed threatening in any way. I didn't smell any odor, and sadly, I never got to see the front of the creature or its entire head. I don't know its sex or anything about its facial features except for the lack of hair, but I do know it was very curious. It wanted to observe me as much as I wanted to observe it. I no longer work for the forestry service, but I wish I could have another encounter. And as an employee of the U.S. Forestry Service, I did not share this story with anyone other than a few family members until 2012, when I finally went online to the BFRO and submitted my first report. And since then, I've done some of my own research and watched what I could. I've met a few others willing to speak about their encounters, and I'm more than happy to meet and speak with anyone who has had an encounter. I believe there was more than one that day. As I sat hidden in that brush, putting my lunch away, it broke a large limb or tree. I was over 240 yards away. I don't believe it was just telling me that it was there. I think it was also telling the others that I was there. Fantastic story to the writer. I, uh, again, I don't know the man's name. I, I think I know because of his email address, but I'm not going to share it because he didn't really say anything about it. But this is, uh, these guys in the forestry service are in a position and in locations to see these things, that, not just these things, but all the things that go on in the forest. And they're used to it. They know it. They're very observant. They know what's out of place. They know what's in place. They know what's usual. They know what's odd. If you spend any time in the woods, e even... You don't have to be a forestry service employee to learn these things. Just go in the woods and be quiet. Like, I know this is probably a little too much commentary, but there are a lot of images out on social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, of blurry things in the background of a forest. And have you ever sat in the woods for... Just, just sit there for three hours and don't move. Just sit there, relax, and kind of focus in on one area of the woods. And if you do that, you'll notice that the light has a lot to do with what you see. And the earth is spinning and the sun is shining light at different angles. And every 10 or 15 minutes, that spot you're looking at will look totally different. And you, your mind can make out shapes and all kind of things in that background as light penetrates through the forest and shines on things that are that are behind what you're looking at. And these guys know these things. They, I mean, I began to notice that deer hunting many years ago. I'm not a big deer hunter. As a matter of fact, I don't really even go to kill. I don't really like killing deer. I have killed several, um, but not many. And I've never... Well, I did kill one buck. Anyway, it's a it's another big deal. I'm just not that interested in killing deer. But I love to be in the woods and just watch and look at all the wildlife. And, and the deer is just icing on the cake. It's great meat. It's good, clean nutrition for me and my family and my friends. And But the big thrill is to sit there and just watch what goes on. And you're seeing what happens in the woods when you're not there. Because if you're quiet, you don't make any noise, and you just, you know, just minimize your presence in the woods it goes right back to normal within about 15 or 20 minutes and you get to see what happens when you're not there and it's a it's an amazing thing listen and look and smell and you get to see all the things that 99 percent of the people on this planet do not get to see so this i don't know why i got off in that but it kind of i know some of these forestry guys and these um, timber cruisers and people that work for 
timber companies and they know the woods they know what's natural they know what's not they're very observant and they can tell you right away that's kind of weird over there and this is what happened here and this is what happened here but anyway it was just an interesting it's an interesting topic i've always thought was fascinating but me i'm a people watcher and i notice what people say and do and why they say and do what they do and it's always been real interesting to me thank you to the writer for sending this i really appreciate it and i believe the story i 100 percent believe the story my name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid YouTube Podcast, also known as the What If It's True Podcast on the Podcast Network. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, anywhere you get your podcast. Search for What If It's True, and we should be right at the top of the list. You're looking at some video or have looked at some video in that first story of me opening some boxes of Yeti Bar soaps. I wanted you to get a feel for what they look like. I know you couldn't smell them. I was smelling them because they smell great. But I had just ordered a big box of them and I thought maybe you'd like to see how they come packaged and how they look when they're opened. And it's a really great product. They're running a sale right now. And if you use the code DC10 at checkout, you get an additional 10% off. Check them out at yetibars.net and yetibars on Facebook. You won't be sorry. It's a great product. Let's jump back into this podcast. All right, here we go. My father was a master sergeant in the Green Beret Special Forces. My parents were friends with their captain and we would spend time with their family. Their house was located in a community in Northwest Dade County called Palm Springs North. This area was the last development Northwest of Dade County. To the west of there, there is nothing but woods and Everglades. While our parents played cards until late, their son Doug and I would ride our bikes all over the area sometimes not getting home until after midnight. On July the 2nd, 1966, Doug and I went to the neighborhood convenience store for snacks. It was much too late for two 12-year-old boys to be out, but times were different then. We then rode back to a vacant lot on the lake close to Doug's house to grub out on the junk food. On the way there, I had spotted a huge white owl in a tree with large black oval-shaped eyes. It was so strange, and I had never seen anything like this. I could not take my eyes off it. Doug was way ahead of me, and he turned back to asking if I was coming. I broke eye contact with the owl, and I yelled to Doug, Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. And when I looked back for the owl, it was gone. We arrived at the vacant lot on the lake. It was a beautiful night. Stars carpeted the black sky. Not long after dropping our bikes, we saw a cylinder-shaped object glowing faintly across the lake. It appeared cylinder-shaped from our point of view, and at the time, neither of us had ever heard of or knew anything about UFOs. We had only seen them in old cheesy Martian movies. The object hovered over the trees with what appeared to be an electrical charge to it, and then it landed across the lake behind some trees and the glowing stopped. It never made a sound. We had to see what this was. It was about 1 a.m. and two 12-year-old boys made the long ride around the lake to the area we thought the object landed. We lined up his parents' house across the lake and we knew we were in the right spot. We only needed to find a way to that forest. Well, I knew this area. An old man in the neighborhood paid me to cut his grass, and I was here every week or so. Now, I was thinking maybe this thing landed close to his house. The dirt road leading to his house came into view on my right, and we took it. The wooded area was dark, and I had trouble seeing the road. I actually didn't want to go further, but we pedaled on. And then I could see the road clearly, like the sun had come up. I was confused at the light. It didn't make sense, and it should not have been there. 
but I was thankful to be able to finally see where I was pedaling. Something was off about this, though. My last memory of the ride down the dusty road was a tingling sensation all over my body. I became dizzy and I dropped the bike in the middle of the road. So did Doug. I remember standing straight up and looking ahead and that's it. Doug was shaking me and telling me to wake up. I was laying on the ground. Sand was all over me like I had been rolling in it. Doug helped me up and I saw it was almost daylight and we were standing in the tall weeds of the vacant lot by the lake, our bikes laying beside us. Both of us, still groggy, dusted the sand off our clothes and we walked our bikes back to Doug's house. Neither of us could ride. Before we got there, we saw a police car in the drive. Our parents noticed us walking in the street and they came running. At first, they were happy to see us. Our mother smothered us with hugs, but they soon got hacked off at us. The usual questions followed and we couldn't answer any of them making our parents think that we were covering something up. Of course we weren't, but how would we explain what had really happened? It was early Saturday morning, and when we got home, I went straight to bed, and I slept until Sunday morning. I never woke once, no dreams, no trips to the bathroom, solid sleep for over 24 hours. That weekend, I was supposed to cut that old man's yard, so I got up and I gassed up the mower. I was about to get on my bike and drag the mower over there, but I felt hungry. I went back inside, and I found a note on the kitchen table in my mother's handwriting. It said that Mr. Shag had called and to forget about cutting his grass. I was disappointed because I wanted to make some money that day. I rode over to Mr. Shag's place, down the same dirt road where this incident happened, to see if he had fired me or maybe found someone to cut the yard cheaper. He was standing in the yard when I rode up. His lawn was black. Something had caught it on fire and burned that beautiful lawn down to nothing. We walked around the back and his healthy garden looked the same. Who burned your yard up, Mr. Shag, I asked. Nothing burned it up, he said. I woke up yesterday, I came out, and this is what I found. There was no fire. Reach down and grab a wad of that black grass and smell it. I did, and I expected to catch a strong charred odor, but it had no odor at all. Something had just sucked the life out of everything green on that property. His yard started growing back that summer but it was almost two months before he needed it cut again, and by the time I next cut his yard, I had forgotten about the entire incident. Mr. Shag talked about black grass and how long it had taken to grow back, and I had no clue what he was talking about. That bugged me for years after. I actually thought that he had become senile and was dreaming things up. Eight or nine years ago, I was surfing through YouTube videos. I was always drawn to the UFO and alien videos. In one video, a man stated that many abductees report seeing a large white owl within hours before their abduction, and that clicked with me. The memories didn't come flooding back, but I remembered the owl that night. Piece by piece, that night's events came back to me over the next year. Some of those pieces fell into place in dreams. I finally remembered as much as I have written in this email, but that is all I can remember. I have been stuck here ever since. There are four or five hours missing, and I cannot find them. I am on a dirt road surrounded by light. Five hours later, I wake up with my buddy in an overgrown field of weeds and sand. It doesn't make sense. Doug and I stayed friends for years. It was not long after this incident that my family moved closer to Doug's house. Life went on, and we never spoke about it. It wasn't in either of our memories at the time. After he and I graduated and went off to school, I lost track of him, and I haven't spoken to him since.
Throughout my adult life, I have suffered from anxiety. Neither can I be closed in a room with no obvious exits. That sends me off the deep end. This all started in my 30s. I was raised in a happy two-parent home. My childhood and adolescent years were normal and a lot of fun. I always had a great attitude, and I don't remember being sad a day in my life. I spoke with a therapist for a season, and he believes it is the result of a traumatic experience, or PTSD. At that time, I had no memory of that night in 1966. I have recently tried to look Doug up, but I have no way to know where life took that kid. I'll keep looking. Maybe he has more answers than I do. This is an email from Betty, Miss Betty. This is uh, quite unusual. I've never read a story like this. I think you'll enjoy it. Miss Betty writes, I spent most of February 2018 in the hospital in central Louisiana. The Red River runs behind that hospital. I was on the fourth floor, and with the floor-to-ceiling windows in my room, I had the perfect view of the flooding that was occurring at that time. Every day I watched the river rise a little more. It left its bank and flooded a small part, leaving just the tops of the trees sticking out of the water. And then it flooded the parking lot and the road that went to the park. I sat there for hours watching the river traffic until it was shut down due to high water. And then I watched as all sorts of debris floated down the river. There were pieces of buildings and trees of all sizes. I even saw a car float by. Close to the bank, or what was supposed to be the bank, was a whirlpool. It must have been eight feet across and it spun round and around, sucking in anything that got close to it. And I often wonder where that stuff went once it got pulled under. One day my husband was there and we were watching the river as usual. Since I was bed bound, there really wasn't anything else to do. And as we watched, we saw a huge pile of debris coming down the river. It floated over toward our side, and by the time it reached us, it was hitting the tops of the trees in the park, and it started breaking up. First, I saw a big tree break off from the pile and move toward the whirlpool. And then something else broke off. As it started moving in the same direction as the tree, it turned in slow circles. I saw the end of it and then the side, and I could tell what it was, but the part that was sticking up out of the water looking like long red hair. The part in the water was moving with the flow and was darker in color, and then it turned to the other end, and this end was bobbing up and down in the water, and when the top broke the surface, it looked kind of pointed. This thing was long and big. I would say it was nine feet long. And that's when it hit me what this thing could be. My husband thought maybe it was a cow, and then he suggested that it could be a horse. And I pointed out how it looked like it was on its belly with its arms and legs stretched out. He said he knew it was big and it had long hair, but he just wasn't sure what it was. But I was sure. As the tree was being sucked into the whirlpool, this thing stopped circling and it turned. It started down the river, and at that moment the nurse came in and drew our attention away long enough that we barely turned back in time as it floated away. My husband will only say that it was very big and hairy. He won't commit himself to say one way or another what it was. But as for me, I was in the hospital and I was on painkillers, but I know what I saw, and nothing will change my mind. And... <laughs> That's the end of her email, and she tells this whole story, but she never says the word. She never says that she thought it was a Bigfoot. I can only assume that that's what she thought it was. Red hair swirling in the water, nine feet tall, something pointy kind of rises out of the water. Maybe it's a conical-shaped head. Who knows? But this is very interesting. I've never read anything like this. And you never hear stories about dead Bigfoots, ever, ever. You'll never hear a story about a dead Bigfoot. I'm not talking about a killed Bigfoot. I'm talking about just a dead Bigfoot someone finds. And she saw one floating down the river from her hospital room. 
I thought that was really interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I did. I'm 59 years old. I live in Springfield, Tennessee, and I've studied Bible prophecy for over 37 years. I believe in angels, and I believe in demons, and I pray a lot. I could write for days the things that I have learned that would blow most people's minds. I tell you these things to explain how I arrived at the conclusions you are about to read. I can't prove what I'm going to tell you, but I swear it happened, and I believe I know what I saw. One afternoon, I visited the fraternity that I belong to at Western Kentucky University. I've always loved playing foosball since my college days in the late 70s. I spent all afternoon at the fraternity house playing foosball with the young guys that day. I dipped a lot of snuff and I drank some beers with the guys. I played until I felt like I needed to get home. It was after 9 p.m. when I got on to I-65 South headed towards Tennessee. I picked up speed as I entered the traffic and was cruising along at 74 miles per hour. I drove for 10 minutes, I guess. I was in the fast lane. I had just passed an 18-wheeler, and I was now passing a car that was behind two other cars, and the lane in front of me was clear for at least 200 more yards. I was enjoying the XM Radio Blues music and thinking about the guys I had just whipped all afternoon at foosball. Out of nowhere, right in front of me, a jet black dog was coming towards me in my lane. He was as big as a German Shepherd. When he saw that I was coming fast at him, he tried to go to his left and he ducked partially in front of the car that was in front of the car that I was passing. He almost got hit, but he jumped back in my lane, barely escaping that other car. He was dead centered on my grill, and all I had time to do was squeeze the steering wheel and brace for the impact. I saw him look straight at me. He had red eyes surrounded by white. He had white teeth and a red tongue. I later realized that the gait he had wasn't that of a normal dog. It was a creepy gait like you would see in a horror movie or something. His front legs were taller than his back legs. Anyone who knows tractors would understand if I said he had a row crop front end. I squeezed the wheel and I tensed up and I smacked the hell out of that thing. There was no time to do anything else. I couldn't swerve left and run off the road and I couldn't swerve right and hit the car that I was passing. There was no time to hit the brakes, so I plastered the thing at 74 miles per hour. I felt the impact big time. It sounded like a 300 Winchester mag went off in the front end of my truck. It went underneath the truck and it rolled under there. It sounded like it probably just tore up major stuff from the front all the way to the back. Immediately, I looked in my rear view mirror to see him come out, but he never did. The car behind me never made any kind of move, and the 18-wheeler I had passed never made any kind of move either. Nobody but me even saw the thing. I slowed down, and I got over to the right lane, and I prepared to get in the emergency lane to stop. But with the traffic like it was that night on the interstate, I decided to see if I could make it to the Franklin exit. I didn't hear any belt squealing, everything sounded good, and my temperature gaze never got hot, so I just kept going. Oh, I was miserable. I just knew that my bumper and grill were all busted up. I was surprised that my radiator was even working. I was surprised that the airbags had never deployed. There was no telling how much damage was underneath my car. I pulled off the interstate at exit 108, which is my exit. I kept heading towards the house. I live about five miles out in the country, and when I pulled into my driveway, I had to pee so bad, I just grabbed my keys and I went into the house to use the bathroom. My neighbors were standing in their front yard. Otherwise, I would have let it fly in the driveway. When I came out of the bathroom, I sat down in my recliner. I told my wife I had just torn up my truck, and I explained what happened. 
She asked how bad it was, and I told her I hadn't looked at it, but I knew it was bad. She told me that we would just get it fixed, and then she went on to bed. I sat there for hours remembering how this thing happened. I realized that dogs don't have white around red pupils. I could explain the red part by the lights in his eyes, maybe. Dogs have brown surrounding their pupils. The big shiny white teeth? Eh, maybe. The red tongue? It was the brightest red lipstick color I have ever seen. And his face planted in the front end of my truck. After studying the situation for hours, I was and I still am convinced it was a demon sent to try to kill me. He tried to run me off the road or into the worst wreck of my life. The next morning, my wife went to look at my truck. She came inside and she told me she couldn't find anything wrong with it. I went and looked and I said, praise the Lord, there wasn't a dent, a scratch, there wasn't anything broken, no blood or hair anywhere. It was as if nothing happened. But it did happen and it should have been bad. All I know is the God that I serve saved me from an evil being that tried very hard to hurt me that night. He paid dearly for it, though. I busted his tail with the Honda Ridgeline doing 74 miles an hour. I rejoice over it today, and it gives me confidence to fight the good fight. The next day, I showed my sister, and I explained everything, just like I have here. It really creeped her out. She didn't know what to say. And after she thought about it some, she finally said that she knew I was telling the truth and she was very glad that I was okay. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate you and we will see you guys on the next one.